going into the book tonight of 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. We're going to read from verse, just three verses tonight. I guess y'all can clap your hands, huh? Three verses, verses 1, 2, and 3. When you have it, say amen. 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. And it reads, Now concerning spiritual gift, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God called as Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Let the church say amen. Amen. We give honor to the Spirit of Christ. Each and every one came out tonight, all the deacons, saints, and friends, first lady. We thank God for all of you being out tonight with us in our Bible study. Tonight we're talking about the testing of counterfeit spiritual gifts. I'm going to read this same three verses in the Living Bible translation. And it says here, it says, Now, brethren, I want to write about the special abilities the Holy Spirit gives to each of you. For I don't want any misunderstanding about them. You, were, you will remember that before you became Christians, you went around from one idol to another, not one of which could speak a single word. But now you are meeting people who claim to speak messages from the Spirit of God. How can you know whether they are really inspired by God or whether they are fakes? Here's the test. No one speaking by the power of the Spirit of God can curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord and really mean it unless the Holy Spirit is helping him. The New Testament Corinth was filled with priests, priestesses, religious prostitutes, soothsayers, and diviners of mysterious religions who claimed to represent God or gods and to have supernatural power that proved their claims. People do not counterfeit what is not valuable. Satan counterfeits the Spirit's gift because he knows they are valuable in God's plan. If Satan can get God's people to become confused about or abusive of those gifts, he can undermine and corrupt the worship and work of the church. Counterfeit gifts, whether through false manifestation or through misguided and selfish use, poison God's spiritual church and makes it weak and ineffective. One of the chief evidence of spiritual immaturity of the Corinthian Christians was a lack of discernment. If an occult practice seemed to have supernatural effect, they assumed it was of God. If a priest or a soothsayer performed a miracle, they assumed it was by God's power. Like many Christians today, they believe that if something works, it must be right and good. But some of the believers realize that the confusion, division, and immoral practices that characterize many of the church members could not be of God. They asked Paul to tell them how to determine what was of the Holy Spirit and what was of some other spirit. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy in the 13th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. How many of y'all know that mostly for every genuine, valuable thing that this world produces, there's always a counterfeit? If it's worth something, they will make a copy of it. And the copy sometimes looks so much like the real thing until it takes a real expert to know the difference. We see all these, uh, what they call them, uh, flea markets. Walk out down the flea markets. You can get you a Gucci. You can get you a Rolex. 
You can get all those kind of expensive items that this world costs, thousands and thousands of dollars, and they'll sell it to you for $500 or $100. And you walk around here thinking that you got the what? The real thing. But the only reason they make duplicates of those things is because they know it's valuable. If it, they, You don't see nobody making duplicates of uh, something that's cheap something that anybody could purchase with a dime or a dollar, they only make copies of things that's worth money. If it ain't worth nothing, doesn't mean nothing to them. And the thing about God's people is that for some reason, we like discernment. We just don't seem to want to really do some research and some time to study and find out if this the real thing or is this just counterfeit or is it just a, a copy Moses told the children of Israel because God don't leave his peoples in ignorance he said this here we're going to read it also in the 18th chapter also but let's look at the 13th chapter of Deuteronomy let's look at what Moses said Moses said this to the children of Israel he said if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and give you a sign or a wonder and he said and the sign or the wonder come to pass. That's the key thing. Notice what he said. It comes to pass, all right? Wherefore he, what for he spoke unto you, saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. No, what Moses was saying, no matter what the sign or the wonder, if what is being said is not scriptural, you don't pay no attention to I hope people don't Forget, Satan do have certain powers, <laughs> and he can do certain things, but he can't tell the truth. And notice what Moses said. Moses said it wasn't the fact that the wonder or the sign came to pass. What was the key thing that let you know that this was not a prophet of God is what he said. He said, if he, he even say, he say the sign, the second verse, he said the sign or the wonder come to pass, which means it, it happened. Like he said. But then he turns around and he says, let us go after other gods. Now look what he said in the third verse. He said, you shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. He said, for the Lord your God proves you or tests you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. What, what's, what's really interesting about that third verse it lets us know the Lord allows false preachers and false teachers to succeed for a while in order to do what? To test his people. Huh? God already knows the ones that's his anyway. And he knows what his people will do, and he knows what they won't do. But the test is for our benefit. Notice it. The Lord allows it. Pope Moses say, the Lord is testing you. To prove you. See if you really love him more than you love these other gods. And so the thing is this, you see, in the fourth verse, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and cleave to what? Him. The Lord and his word is our object of what? Faith. And that's all we are to rely on. That's why I always ask people, I say, did the Bible say that? Is that in the Bible? And a lot of people get mad when you ask them that. Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know if that's the truth. If it's not written in the Word, or if it don't agree with God's Word, people say a lot of things that sound good, don't they? They'll tell you in a minute about the Holy Ghost. They'll say, man, you know, you can run out of Holy Ghost. I say, well, how is that? You know, things evaporate. As if the Holy Ghost is a liquid. But the Holy Ghost ain't no liquid. You understand what I'm saying? People say these kind of things. But you have to go to what? To Scripture. It sounds good, but guess what? It ain't the truth. All right? And the fifth verse says this here. It says, that prophet or that dream of dreams, Paul said, what you got to do to him? Put them to death. Because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to stress you out of the way which the Lord your God commanded you to walk in. So you shall put away the evil from among you. 
God plainly stated here, he wants his people to refuse any false prophet, any false doctrine, any false teaching. God don't want us to deal with that at all. He said, in other words, just totally, once you find out it's false, then totally put it out of with what? Out of your life, out of your ears, out of your sight. Don't have nothing to do with it. Go to the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. Let's read what Moses said to the children of Israel. See, God ain't going to leave you in the dark. He ain't going to let the, the false prophet, he, he going to tell you the truth, and then he going to see what you're going to do with that truth. Because the false prophet comes to test and find out, are you really going to obey God? You really believe God's word? And he comes along and he's going to tell you something that's entirely different. You know the story of Eve and the serpent. The serpent told Eve something entirely different than what God told her. But God allowed the serpent to come where? Right there in the garden. And he knew what the truth was. But the devil said, you shall not surely die. And God had been told her, you would die. But the, instead of her leaning on what God said and trusting in what God said, she listened to what the devil said and lost everything she had. All right, now look at uh, Deuteronomy. Do we have it? <coughs> we, I'm, I, I would read from 9 to 22, but I don't think we're going to have time. But we'll try. First, we want to read about the prophecy of the Messiah. Look at the 15th verse. We're going to start there. It said, the Lord your God will raise up unto you a prophet from the midst of you and of your brothers, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. According to all that you desire of the Lord your God to her up in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire anymore that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. He said, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brothers, like unto you, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my word, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But he said, now he's speaking about the false prophet, the 20th verse. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, he said, even that prophet shall what? Die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Moses tells him the answer. He said, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, you shall not be afraid of him. Moses is saying, look, if it don't come to pass, and the prophet spoke it in the name of the Lord, he said, don't you have nothing to do with that prophet. Don't even worry about him, don't fear him, because that's a false prophet. Anything God says, it has to come to pass, because God is no liar. If you say it in the name of the Lord, this is God's word, then it has to come to pass. A lot of God's people don't follow up on what these prophets are saying to them. To find out, did it really actually come to pass? Did it, what he said actually come true? And they just go on and go on and go on. But and then some things are so general, and say, I know God didn't say it. One thing about God's word, another thing, is not God specific. Elijah was sitting in a city that was desperate for food, Desperate for anything. In fact, people was eating donkey heads and and uh, dove dung and paying huge amount of money for it. He said, tomorrow, he prophesied this. He said, tomorrow, about this time. He said, it's going to be so much until you can buy as much as you want with a penny. Fill you up. Now, that's something. And he said, this, th this thus says the law. That's something. When it came to pass, you got to say what? God said that. <laughs> Huh? He changed poverty into abundance in a 24-hour period. That's, and he said God was going to do it. And when he spoke it, he spoke it at a time where there was no way. Even, even the king's wise men, his advisor said, man, if God was to open up the windows of heaven, that couldn't happen. And God just told him, he said, oh, yeah, you're going to see it, but you're not going to participate in it. 
In other words, you're going to die. Just because he didn't believe that that was the word of the Lord. And just as he had said, the people stampeded him and killed him. That's the same way you have to look at the word of God. This is the word of God. Whatever this says, that's why I don't care what people say, don't sound right, don't make no sense. That's the word of God. And as long as it's the word of God, I'm sticking with it. It may not sound right, may not look like it's the truth, but that's the word of God. And God tests us sometimes just to see if we really believe his word. Now, look at 1 John, the fourth chapter. And then look at the first three verses. John, 1 John 4, and the first three verses. And it reads, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but what? Try the spirit, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Howbeit know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Well, ye have heard that it should come, even now it's already in the world. God's word has already warned us that there are going to be counterfeits. Jesus warned us. He said, there will be false prophets. He said, there will be wolves coming in sheep clothing. God has already told us there will be all kinds of prophets out there, prophesying things that God didn't say. So it, it behooves us to be discerning and listen. A lot of people get caught up in the excitement, the noise, the music, and don't pay no attention to what's being said. A lot of times, I, I, I remember one time a man t said this here. He said, he said he went to a place where the, uh, the, the preacher was preaching. He said all the man did was hollering. Everybody was jumping up, falling down. He said all the man was doing was hollering. He ain't say not one word of God. He just said, oh, yes. Why didn't, don't you do this? Ah! And everybody was jumping up and down. But he ain't say a word. They speak a bit of truth. And everybody's falling around. Dumb. He said, what good was that? You didn't get nothing out of it. You understand? Bible said all your getting get you an understanding. You know, don't, don't just take it because somebody said it was done this way. Or oh, I've seen it done that way. Find out if it agrees with the scripture. Now, going back to your notes on page, they say, but remember what the Lord Jesus said. He said, not everyone that says unto me, what? Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But notice what's, what's going to identify who's going into heaven. But he that doeth what? The will of my Father, which is in heaven. He said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And he said, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. He said, the question is, why will that be? Because their profession is on the surface. The Lord Jesus was not their Lord. See, people say a lot of things. And how many of y'all see them? Um, I won't give on to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then go right around and cuss everybody out. Huh? It's not in their heart. People say a lot of things out their mouth. But if it's not in their heart, that's a false profession. All right, Paul wanted to make sure that the Corinthians have a clear and complete understanding of their spiritual gift. And Paul was deeply concerned that those brothers have a proper understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, especially in relationship to the gifts to them. A lot of people don't like studying God's word, and they don't want to give an ounce of honest study to the word of God. And the devil likes that. Because if you don't really pay any attention, don't really give any sweat or any dedication to the word of God, the devil loves that. The, the Bible study, Sunday school nights in most churches, if a church have 3,000 people, you'd be lucky if you get 300 to come to Bible study. Because they're just not interested in sitting down and listening to somebody tell them what thus says the Lord from his word. They'd rather be up there on Sunday morning with all the plums and all the music and all the crowds and, and the preacher preaches 15, 30-minute sermon. And they go home and they sad, they're glad with that. And all week long, they don't give no time 
to the study of God's word. The devil loves that. As long as you can jump and shout and dance and don't know nothing, the devil loves that. You understand? But <coughs> God's main purpose, <coughs> he told the disciples, he said, it's for you to know. He came down here and taught them personally so that they would know. I mean, if God took up that much time, three and a half years, they got teaching from God. Can you imagine the kind of teaching they probably got? But for three and a half years, he taught them him, himself personally. So God wants you to know. God wants you to understand. Now, let's go into our lesson. Go back to 1 Corinthians. And let's look at the 12th verse. Let's look at the first two verses. It said, now concerning what? Spiritual gift, brother. This part I want you to say. I would not have you what? Ignorant. Huh? He said, you know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these what? Dumb idols, even as you were what? Led. So now, Paul wanted the Corinthians to not be ignorant about the identification and the use of their spiritual gifts. The church cannot function, and it certainly cannot mature without properly and faithfully using the gifts God give his peoples for ministry. And the apostle assured the Corinthians that it was possible for them to know the truth about the spiritual gift and that he was determined to teach them. Now, when you see this, this word here, Notice what this statement, and you read it a lot, especially in the New Testament, especially under Paul's writing, where he said, I would not that you be what? Ignorant. That's mean that what he's about to get ready to show or uh, uh, reveal to you is something critical. And he don't want you to be unaware. He don't want you to have no understanding about it. He wants you to know and have a clear and complete understanding about what he's about to teach. All right? And if you, it, 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 in fact, let's go see chapter 10 and verse 1 of, of 1 Corinthians. He uses that same line. He says, moreover, brothers, what? I would not that you should be ignorant. So the thing is, is this. It's critical what he's getting ready to teach us. Now, Go down to Leviticus 4 and 2. God has something to say about ignorance. Look at 4 and 2. And he's talking about sin. He says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, y'all got it? Leviticus 4, he says, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, if a soul shall sin through what? Ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not be done and shall do against any of them. See, God had provisions in the law for people who did things that they weren't aware was sin. They, they didn't know. They didn't have the knowledge of it. And so God said with Moses what to do for those type of people. Then he had another law for people who knew what to do and willfully didn't do it. All right? And so the thing is, God wants us, when he speaks, he wants us to pay close attention. Because what he's about to tell us is something critical, something that we need to know. I looked up the definition of the word ignorance, and it says, Lacking education or knowledge, unaware or uninformed, not to know. Now, I mean, in this church, if somebody say, I got $100, can we switch bills? And you had $100 too. Now, you switch bills with this individual, and then you find out later, when you go to try to buy something with that bill, that it's counterfeit. How many in this church would be totally hurt? I believe everybody in this church. Because you know one thing, you out of $100. And 
And the reason you were deceived because you was educated, you was uninformed, you didn't know the truth about what he was handling you was actually what? Counterfeit money. This the same way the devil uses his deception. He loves ignorant people. He loves people who don't study, people who don't know, people who don't educate themselves on the word of God. And he will lead them down to, the, like Jim Jones, down to the wilderness to drink poison. Or he'll lead them like that other false prophet. He'll give you 30 cents, put it in your pocket, put you on a pair of tennis shoes, lay up in the bed, drink you some poison, so you're going to meet that spaceship following that coming. They do that because people don't know. It's a terrible thing. How many of you all say to yourself, boy, if, if I had only known. Have you ever made that statement before? I would have never married her. I would have never married him. I would have never went there. I would have never brought that. I would have never did that. All oh, that's after the fact, isn't it? And the reason is after the fact because why? You didn't know. And see, and God don't want you to come to him after the fact the devil done beat you out your house, done beat you out your money, done beat you out of everything you got, and sit up there and talk about, man, I wish I would have. No. God gives us understanding. God gives us his word. He tells us, get this, grasp this. This is critical to your spiritual life. There's a lot of people have been fooled because they didn't take God's word serious. So Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant. In fact, let's go to uh, Romans 1 and 13. One of 13, notice what he said. This is a critical truth. E every time you see, I would not you be ignorant, always say to yourself, man, this is something critical coming up. This is something I really need to know. All right? He said, now I would not have you ignorant, brothers, that all the time my purpose to come to you, but let hither that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Paul said, I'm a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarian, to the wise, to the unwise. And as you read the first chapter of Romans, and those who have studied the first chapter of Romans, ain't it good to know all those things that he said in there? I'm telling you, it's beautiful. All right? Another thing, go to Romans 11, 25. Use the same thing. Do you have? Romans 11, 25 says this here. He said, for I would not, brothers, what? That you should be ignorant of this mystery. Huh? That blindness in part has happened to who? Israel. Because they were going around thinking God done forgot about Israel. No, God ain't forgot about Israel. He just got a, a blindness over them in part. Huh? Until a full number of the Gentiles be what? Come in. Then also look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13. There are going to be a lot of God's people up in heaven going to be heartbroken because of the things they didn't know, didn't find out, and didn't get up to heaven and find out, oh, boy, you could have had all this. could have did all this. And because they didn't study and research God's word, they was left out. Thank you. Do we have uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13? Notice what it says. And this is something very good for us to know. He said, but I would not have you what? To be ignorant. Brethren, concerning them which are what? Asleep. That you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. He said, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, he said, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will what? Bring with him. We need to know that. Those are things that people sometimes don't understand. Death is not the final say so. We are going to meet them again. They are going to rise up. There's going to be a rapture. So Paul said, look, I don't want you to be ignorant. Even Paul went into Berea. In fact, let's go to the book of Acts, the 17th chapter. And look at the 10th verse. Acts 17 and verse 10 through 12. Notice these peoples, even though he was Apostle Paul, 
even though he had been through a lot of things, and even though he had won a lot of people to Christ, they just didn't accept him on his credentials. Then because he's Pastor Paul, then because he called himself a man of God, they just didn't accept him on his credentials. But notice what the peoples did. Acts 17 and 10. Paul had just been kicked out of one city, and now he was coming over to this city. And he said, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who's coming thither, went into the synagogues of the Jews. Now notice what happened. It's a, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And that what? They received the word with all readiness of mind. And what? Search the scripture daily, whether those things were so. In other words, just because he was Apostle Paul, just because he had won over souls, just because he had done a lot of miracles, they still searched the scripture to see if what he was saying was according to the word of God. Some folks just take you at your word, but if it don't read it in the scripture, I don't follow. And the thing is that this, follow God's word. God's word is going to lead you to the truth. It's going to lead you in the right direction. Satan is always going to counterfeit that which is the truth. And like I said earlier, you know something is valuable when they start making counterfeit copies of it. If it ain't valuable, they don't make no, they don't waste no time making no counterfeit. You think if money wasn't valuable, they wouldn't make no counterfeits of it? That's why they make it. Because they know that it is valuable. And so they do that. And you, the ones who get sometimes beaten or deceived, you know how that feels, don't you? Somebody that said they gave you something, and you look around, and it's really not the real thing. If I was to bring Sister Boone a, a glass diamond and tell her this is a, this is a one-carat diamond, and I paid half a million dollars for it, and Sister Boone go to a, 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 a real jeweler, and he puts it under that microscope, and he don't see nothing but glass. <laughs> yeah, you call the police because he told you that was a carrot diamond. And who would be hurt? Especially if you gave that man what? A half a million dollars. See, I want you to understand something. It's important that you know the truth because if you are deceived, if you are taking advantage, uh, the only person that hurts is you. Because if somebody told you what to do, told you what the truth is, and you don't follow it, the only person to blame is who? It's you. It's in God has his word here for us. I tell people, how you, how you know the, the tricks of the devil? How you know the deception of the devil? How you know that if this is of God or this is of truth? The only way you're going to know is you're going to have to study the word of God. you got to know the truth. You know, they, they, they tell me, and I'm, I, I, I heard this that those who work in the treasury, they teach them first what a real bill looks like. They study everything about a real bill, a real, like a dollar or a hundred dollar bill. They study everything about it in order that they might be able to discern the counterfeit. They have to first know what true bill actually looks like. They don't start them off showing them counterfeit bills first. They start them off showing them what the real bill is like. And it's the same way with God. God wants you to know what the real gifts of the spirits are. God wants you to know exactly what that gift is supposed to do. And God wants you to know exactly what his word says. So that when you come up against something that's not of God's word, you will know it because why? First you know the truth. You can't discover no error. You can't discover nothing that's counterfeit unless you know what the real thing is like. And that's the only way. And so, going back to your notes. He says this. He said, led astray to some dumb idols. One of the chief characteristics of most pagan religion was idolatry. As former pagans, the Corinthian Christians had once been led astray to the dumb idols. Now go back to Corinthians 12 and 1 and 2. You know what really, 
what really gets us a lot of time is that we go back to some of the old things that we used to do or heard about, and without doing any research, we thought it was right, and we bring that into the church, and because we thought it was right, or we, our mama told us it was right, we didn't do no research, we bring that foolishness into the church, and when you hear something different, you just reject it, not knowing what the word of God said, but because you just believe what somebody told you. And the thing is, what Paul is dealing with here with these Corinthians is this. He said, look, I know where you came from. I know your background. Your background is in idolatry. Your background is in witchcraft. Your background is with uh, soothsayers. Your background is with uh, the, uh, what they call those people, them soothsayers, those old people who do that prediction, the palm readers. He said, that's what you came out of. So now, can you imagine what kind of mind they had? Now he was com you coming into the truth out of all of that deception. They thinking what they was in was the truth. Now Paul is telling them something entirely different. There's a story in the book of Acts about uh, Philip the evangelist. And he went into Samaria. And the Bible said that there was a man there who had bewitched the people. They thought he was some great God. Then Philip came in telling them there's only one God. And the people listening and seeing the things that Philip was doing, they found out that Philip was telling the truth. And this man had been lying to them all the time. See, the thing is this. You need to know the truth. Paul said this, are we, are, we, are we back to 1 Corinthians? Let's look at that second verse, in the 12th verse. He said, you know that you are Gentiles, <coughs> carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were what? Led. Now, before we got saved, every last one of us was led by a spirit. You say, how do you know that? Because you was under either control of sin or you under control of the devil. And the thing is about this, people out there in the world think they're free, but in actuality, they're captive. They don't have no freedom at all. Because the fact of the matter is you may want to do good, you may want to do what's right, and for a time you might even achieve by doing some of those things. But that won't be your nature. The devil will ensure that you don't keep that line of living. And so, the thing is that this here, Paul said, you was led these dumb idols. And what do you mean by that? An idol can't speak, an idol can't see, and an idol can't hear. Do you not know that? When you walk up to Buddha and you say, oh, Lord Buddha, please help me today. That's a rock. Or that's a piece of wood. You understand what I'm saying? When they walk up to different things, that's not God. Paul said, look, you were led. In other words, you were led by the spirits to these dumb idols. And you, and you thought those were gods, but they are not gods. You can pray to them. You can ask them questions. They won't answer you. huh? They can't even touch you. But in your mind, because you've been deceived and thinking that a god can be formed to where you can see it and touch it, to the fact that you're just thinking that they are gods. So Paul said, don't be ignorant. Drop all that foolishness that you came out of and start listening to the truth. And so, the thing is this, look at you and say, one of the most common misconceptions about the ungodly life is that it is free. I do, I can do what I want. In contrast to the Christian life, which is him then by rigorous restriction. But just the opposite is true. The unbeliever is a captive of sin and of Satan. He has some choice as to the type of sin, but he has no choice as to whether or not to sin. However you were led, the apostle said, you were led. You had no choice. Whether you went into idolatry willingly or not, you could not help it. See, the people of the world think they're doing what they want to do, and actually they're doing exactly what the spirit of the devil is telling them what to do. The only one that's actually doing what they want to do and, and I, I find that hard sometimes to accept, are the children of God. Nobody 
can make you do what you don't want to do. God has given you the power over all deception, over all the power of the enemy. God has given the devil sin. Nothing can make you do wrong. You got power over that. If you do wrong because you yield to it, because you desire to do it. But the person out there in the world, he don't have that kind of choice. If the devil tell him to lie, guess what he going to do? He going to lie. If the devil tell him to steal, what he going to do? He going to steal. Because he don't have the power to resist it. You have the power to resist it. You can choose whether to do right or to do wrong. But the enemy or the people who are out there that are not saved, they don't have that choice because they don't have that power. And so, going to page three, dumb does not mean unintelligent, but speechless, literally without voice. No idol can respond to man's need, and by definition, an idol is a man-made and impersonal. No idol can help but being dumb. It, have you ever wondered why would a person pray to the sun? In his mind, he's been deceived that that's something that's what? That's powerful. And so he filled within himself that that can answer his problems. That can do. I've seen people, especially people who, who gamble a lot. They get that card and they say, man, they pray to that card. They say, God, I know you the number. <laughs> I know you're going to bring me all my money. <laughs> and they pray to it because they're looking for something. You see, the thing is this. The devil has things to give also. But a lot of things he's giving to you is trying to get you to do what is wrong. Now, let's look at that thing he said. Going back to the 12th chapter. He said, you know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. When I used to work, I had guys that I used to meet that I had in the jailhouse and stuff. I had guys I would meet, and I would come to find out some of them couldn't count. I would come to find out some of them couldn't read. And they were good at, you know, doing their little games on the street, one of the little things. I used to ask them, I say, how do you count your money? How do you know you ain't being cheated? And he laughed at me, he tried to push it off. Because he, he couldn't he couldn't add and he couldn't subtract. So I would ask him, I said, how do you know them people ain't cheating you? Oh man, they give me my money just like they're supposed to give me. I said, but how do you know? Because if you can't add or subtract, how do you know that guy counted you out $20? How do you know he when he subtracted $5, that he gave you 15. You understand? And he didn't look at me. He said, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. Then I asked another dude because he couldn't read. I said, you can't read. How do you know what you're signing? You might be signing your life away. All because you got what? You don't, you don't read. See, Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant because an ignorant person is a vulnerable person. Easily taken advantage of. People with education and know different things, they're hard to deceive. Because if you know how to count, and you give me $20, and you say it only costs 5 and I give you back a dollar, you ain't going to walk away like a kid and go to school saying, hold on, I got my money. You know that, hey, no, you, you owe me a few more dollars here. And see, the thing is that this here. God don't want you to just walk into something and just accept it as being true without knowing the truth. Because there are people who, how many of y'all know when the, the year 2000 came in, there were people selling off their houses, giving away their bank accounts, giving away their cars. Because somebody went out there and told them Jesus was coming back in the year 2000. And people were doing all those things. Signing their house off. I don't need this no more. I'm getting ready to go back home with Jesus. Giving away their money. People say, I don't need this no more. I'm so, I wish I would have got some of it, but. <laughs> but I would have felt bad because I know the truth. <laughs> I know the truth. 
But because those people didn't know the truth, they gave away their houses, gave away their cars, gave away their bank account. And when the year 2000 came in, guess what? They were broke. And Jesus, what? He didn't go. Now, the Bible plainly states that no man knows the hour or the day. So when somebody gets up to tell you, I know Jesus is coming back tomorrow, just walk away. You ain't got to worry about it. The Bible said, don't nobody, not even, now the angels live in heaven. They don't even know. So how are you down here on earth going to know? But yet people believe that lie and sold everything they had, gave away everything they had because they believed Jesus was coming in the year 2000. You see, the Bible tells us the truth. All we got to do is believe the truth and we won't be deceived. And so Paul said, now, spiritual gifts are exciting, ain't they? We see somebody get up out of a wheelchair. You see somebody's eyes blind and open. Or you see somebody cast. They are very exciting, interesting, and they are very deceptive. Because you thinking that that's the work of God, or is that the work of what? Of the enemy. You, if you read the story of an Exodus in the Old Testament with Moses and Pharaoh, how many of y'all know that story? When Moses threw down his rod, what did the Bible say? He said those magicians threw down their rod. And what was the difference? All of them were snakes down that looked it like snakes. Well, there was only one true snake down there. But when he threw down his rod and they threw down their rod, you couldn't tell the difference. They looked the same. But we know there's only what? One creator. The devil cannot create y'all. He ain't got the power of life in him. Only God has that. So you got to know that is a fake. But the people didn't know that. But Moses turned the water to blood. They turned water to blood. When Moses turned different things, they, they followed right back. They, they, uh, all theirs was what? Counterfeit. There wasn't nothing truthful about it. It was all a deception. But it looked what? Real. Now, if the devil is copying God, and the main thing he want to copy God on is his gifts. Because people are fascinated about spiritual gifts. And if anything the devil want to use, he want to use them gifts to his advantage. So Paul said, look, I, I, I'm going to try to teach you about every gift. I want you to understand every gift. I want you to know all about every gift so that you won't be what? Deceived. We, you read it all through the Old Testament where the children of Israel were deceived by false prophets. Okay, so now let's read on down, the third verse. I told y'all I was going to get y'all. I had three verses, but I hope I was going to make it. Amen, amen. Wherefore, I give you, notice what he says here. I give you to what? Understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by what? Now, that sounds simple, doesn't it? You could do that, couldn't you? But it's something about that that we got to look into. All right. Say he spends a lot of time in church. How many of y'all believe that? I, he don't spend it in the bars. He, why would he go down there? He don't need them. He got them. He want the folks he don't have. Why would Satan come in your house and your house full of all kind of witchcraft, all kind of devil men? I don't need to be in your house. I want that house with that Bible, that house that's full of the spirit. I want to go down there. Satan said, you, you read in the Bible, it said when Jesus went into the synagogue, it said that was a man with an unclean spirit sitting in the, in the audience. Didn't the Bible say that? And he spoke out to Jesus. He said, what you doing here? Ain't that a stupid question? That's God. You in God's house, and you asking him, what you doing here? It's like you coming home. And somebody, I remember our house got broken one time, and this white man walked in our house, and my mama walked into him, <laughs> and my mama screamed so loud, she woke all of us up. And that white man told him, he said, what you doing here? He was drunk as a skunk. My mama said, what you doing here? What you doing in my house? <laughs> and when he saw all those black heads look around that corner and look at him, <laughs> he got out of there. <laughs> my 
what I'm saying. The devil ain't going to hang around somewhere where he own. He want to go somewhere that he don't own. And the demon asked Jesus that. Didn't he ask him that? He said, what you, what you here for? What you in this church for? The devil's shocked that God's in this church. And you know why he was shocked? He was shocked because had no Holy Spirit ever walked up in that synagogue. Had nobody righteous ever walked up in that synagogue. And the devil had control. Now here comes somebody with the power of God, righteous, and walk up in that church. What you think? Wait a minute. What you doing here? It's like you in a hypocritical, phony, everybody doing everything they want to do, and you walk up in there, you living right. Everybody going to say, what you doing in that church? You don't belong here. The devil don't want to be where God is. He want to be where God is not. But he love hanging around the church. You hear me? He love hanging around the church. All right. Nowhere is he more anxious to pervert God's people than where they are well, worshiping. Some members of the church at Corinth apparently became so fleshly and confused and their worship so paganized and frantic that they even allowed the Lord to be cursed within their own congregation. So Paul gave two principles, one negative, one positive, for the testing of the validity of gifts and their use. The negative test. Those who are saying Jesus is a curse and claim to be speaking by the Spirit of God. To say that Jesus is a curse is to condemn his nature, his character, and his work, and not to mention his holiness and glory. Paul tells the Corinthians that no such blasphemous utterance could possibly be by the Spirit of God. Now that sounds simple to us, don't it? But people say things not so obvious that we accept as being God. Have y'all seen some of the, the some of the, the the fast that was going on in the church? When they had they call this laughing spirit? Everybody had the laughing spirit for a while. Where is it now? Did God quit laughing? You don't see it no more, do you? And a lot of, they have all these little different fasts that come in and they don't last long and they're gone. Showing you that they wasn't of God. But some people follow anything that goes. And so the thing is this. These people that then got to a point where somebody can actually cuss God and tell them he's speaking through the Holy Spirit. My wife said something to me one time. A man said something. We was preaching. And he hauled off and spit right on this lady. And he told her, he say, that's the Holy Spirit. Holy anointing, that's what he told her. <laughs> My wife said, that ain't nothing but spit. <laughs> And, and that's all it was. And that's all he had to say. Ain't no holy anointing in that. You mess around, you spit out, and he hit him. That was it. <laughs> Y'all laughing. But these are the kind of things people just accept. All right? Nothing should have been more logical and obvious, but they have fallen back so deeply into ecstasy and enthusiasm that their judgment was completely walked. As long as it took place in the church and was presented by someone who claimed to be a Christian, any teaching or practice was accepted without question. The content was ignored even to the extent of disregarding that which was obviously immoral and blasphemous. There are some things that's so obvious so I wonder why even common sense couldn't tell you there's something wrong with that. If I was to offer you this bottle here and tell you all, Y'all give me $5,000 for this bottle. Because in this bottle resides the Holy Spirit. Now, if you was ignorant enough and gave me $5,000, I'm going to go order me $5,000 more. You know why? I found me a pool of fools. Huh? Offering this bottle. And it ain't nothing but a bottle of olive oil. Is it not? People pay money for things that are just obvious. I often look at that thing where they say, uh, I, I, I heard my, my friend told me about this man brought a box of handkerchiefs in the church. He sold those handkerchiefs for money. And those people gave him big time money for those handkerchiefs because he told them the more money you give, the more blessed you'll be. Let me tell y'all something. Did you, did you read that Paul brought the handkerchief or the handkerchief was brought to Paul? The Bible says they brought handkerchiefs to him. And then his touching them, and they took it back to the peoples, and they was healed. 
But these people are bringing the handkerchiefs, and the people are giving the money, and they're taking the money. It didn't say Paul charged anybody anything, did it? I didn't read where he got any money. If that's what God, what, the, the one thing I want you to understand about the spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts are freely given. The gift is given for you to freely use for God's people. Not for you to make a name, not for you to get rich. It was freely given to you because without the Holy Spirit, it wouldn't operate. Which means that you don't operate it on your own, it's operated through the Spirit of God. And that's God doing the work. It's not you. So the first thing you got to understand is this here. There is no cost for the spiritual gift to be used on your life. If somebody tells you, you got to give me $500 for you to lay hands on me and for God to heal me, walk away. If somebody tells you, you got to give me $1,000 to hear what the Lord has to speak to me, walk away. Because if it's given by God, Jesus told the disciples, <coughs> he said, Freely as you receive, he said, freely give. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, open up the eyes of the blind, cast out the devil. He said, freely as you receive, freely give. That gift is not for your personal gain. It's not to make you an important, popular person, but it's for the building up of God's people. That's what that gift is for. All right? So now. It is possible that a person who called Jesus a curse was Jewish because the law taught that a person who hanged on a tree is accused of God. Many Jews consider Jesus to have called, have been cursed by being crucified. But whether a person is Jewish or Gentile, his claiming to be a Christian and claiming that what he says or does is spiritual does not make it so. Paul hit them over the head with the obvious. How can you possibly be so confused? How can you, who are truly Christian, fail to recognize those who are not? How can you be so utterly incapable of recognizing, say, the counterfeit gifts? How can you even believe that cursing the Lord and Savior could be of the Holy Spirit? That's, now, it hurts me when I'm obviously stupid. And get deceived because of my stupidity. I mean, I know if that man give me, uh, this man walked up to me at, at our Publix one day. He told me, he said, my car broke down. I need for you to give me a ride to my house so I can get my, my tools. You know what he did? He pulled out a roll of money about a whole handful. Wrapped up with rubber bands. Now, on the outside, he had a hundred dollar bill. But how many of y'all know all in the middle of that was nothing but paper? Now, they we already know it on the job, they already warned us about stuff like that. But the thing is this here. All he wants you to do is take him where he's got his friends waiting for you, so he can take your car. Because you think when you see it all this money, you figure he got money, and you figure that he's somebody you can trust. But the first thing gets you is this. Who in their right mind will pull out a roll of money that thick and show it to people who don't know you from Istanbul and make you think that he got money? And then you figure, oh, he going he gonna to tip me, he going to give me some money. Go right over there and wind up getting your car stolen. All because your mind told you something that looked it good, but in actuality it was a deception. And see the thing, somebody said if it if it, if it sounds too good, if it looked too easy, you better get away from that. Huh? And the thing is this here, God wants us to know the truth. And the first test, I'm going on page four, the first test of a spiritual gift is doctrinal. If a person holds a derogatory view of Jesus Christ, then what he says and does is not of God. We should always compare a teaching or a practice with what? With the word of God. That is the test of it being of the Holy Spirit. The only way to be sure if something is spiritual is to be sure it is scriptural. 
And if it ain't scriptural, I guarantee if I was coming to this church, to everybody in this church, God told me for all y'all, stand on y'all head and put $100 on the floor. Now, how many people would believe that? Y'all say, Pap, I, I know most of y'all say, Pastor Boone done lost it, y'all. <laughs> and for one thing, I can't imagine Sister Austin sitting on her head with a hundred dollar bill in front of her. <laughs> if she do that, I'm gonna put that on Facebook. <laughs> I know I <laughs> But if you don't know, you just jump right down now. You don't do it. Always test it by the word of God. All right? The positive test is this. No one can say Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul is, of course, speaking of sincere what? Confession. An unbeliever can un easily utter these words. We know they can. But true confession is based on true faith, of which obedience to God's word is the what? True mark. Confess that Jesus the Lord means nothing less un unless it involves affirming who he really is and obeying what he commands. One whom we do not really know and obey cannot truly be our what? Lord. The title Lord implies deity. Confessing Jesus as Lord, therefore, was always understood as confessing Jesus as God. What a person truly believes about Jesus Christ is a test of whether or not what he teaches and does is by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always leads men to ascribe lordship to Jesus Christ as a divine person to be obeyed what? If your ministry ain't pointing to Jesus and it's pointing to you, that's not of the Lord. If you're teaching and all you're trying to teach is just for you and not of Jesus, it's not of the Lord. Everything we do and everything we say is supposed to be to the what? To the glory of God. God's supposed to get the glory out of not you. I don't care how good you sing. I don't care how good you teach. I don't care how good you preach. God's supposed to get the glory. And the thing is this. All it takes is just a few moments a, a day getting into the word of God and study it. And that's how you know whether or not this is of God or if this is of man. And the thing is, a lot of things seem good, feel good, look right. But guess what? not the truth. Uh, just before we close, I want you to look at Romans. I believe it was the 10th chapter. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to look at the, I'm going to show you something that Paul says. very interesting. Romans 10, 1 and 2. It says this here. Say, brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be what? Say, he said, for I bear them record that they have what? A zeal. They're excited about God. But what? But not according to knowledge. For they being what? Ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul said, I don't care how excited they are, I don't care how much zeal, I don't care how much faith they claim they got. He said, if it ain't according to the word of God, right? Because that, I mean, there are some people that are really dedicated to their beliefs, aren't they? But they don't have no knowledge of the word of God. There are people who go live out on mountains, get away from society for years because they believe what they believe. Of being taught is the truth. But it's a lie. Paul said, they don't want to submit to what's right. And there are a lot of people, they are, are, are bless God, thankful. They are very committed to their beliefs, but it's not according to knowledge. And if it's not according to knowledge, if it's not according to scripture, I don't care how good it looks or how much you feel about it, if it's not right, it's not right. And the thing is, the only thing that makes it right is is it according to the word of God. Oh, that man, boy, his preacher just make me feel so good. 
and he ain't said nothing truthful. Oh, that girl sang is just went through me. All she was rapping about was fornication and drugs and drinking. But it sounds so good. Yeah. Ain't got nothing to do with it. It's according to knowledge. And the thing is that this here, when you find out the truth, walk there in. Buy the truth, sell it now. There are things out there that looks good, sounds good, but it ain't no good. And you got to know the difference. You have to sometimes sit back and you have to study. Sometimes you have to sit back and you have to look and wait. Some things don't just come right to you. Sometimes you have to sit back and you have to wait. And God will reveal the truth to you. I've always remembered what Fern sister said one time. Her sister Wanda, this man came up to her and told her, he said, God told me, you my wife. And Fern sister said, hey, I wasn't even looking for no husband. I didn't ask God for no husband. So why he coming to me and tell me that I'm his wife? So she said, if that's the truth, Lord, she said, reveal it unto me. And that preacher, boy, he could preach too. Got on the pulpit one day, and I saw a tail <laughs> coming out of him, going around the other side, looked like a dragon. And everybody got mad with me when I was saying I said, no, that, that, that boy got something wrong with that boy. He, he, ain't got, he ain't the truth. He took a some place claim he was taking us someplace. Well, I took her to his house, and y'all know what he did when he got that don't you? She got out of the house so fast, tried to have, you know, sexual intercourse. But the thing is, is this. When God, when you want to know the truth, God will show you the truth. It's when you don't want to know the truth, and you want to do what you want to do, God will step back. But after you find out the truth, then you want to blame God. There's no reason to blame God because I'm sure God was telling you, don't go this way. All right? So we thank God for his word. We're going to continue on in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And this is very interesting, especially when it comes to the gifts of the spirit. God wants us to know how these gifts operate. He wants us to have a complete understanding of who got the real thing, and who got that counterfeit, so that you will not be fooled. Let us lift up our hands towards heaven. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless for the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To only wise God, I'll say it, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. all the people of God saying, amen. Shake somebody's hand and say, Jesus loves you.